name. What do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. New Testament tells what happened in the soul of man. These experiences were heard and seen by none, save by him in whom they occurred. Through these experiences, that man gained the certainty that he is God. It happens in man. That man is then called the Word of God. As we are told, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. We are told that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he is called the Word of God. To show what intimate relation exists between the written oracle in which God declared his will to man and that personal word which abides forever in us. For he sent his word, as we are told, and the word that goes forth from my mouth shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. And the sender and the saint are one. For if in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, well then, God and his word are one. So he sends his word, and his word abides in us. In time, that word will erupt like a flower, like a tree, at the season of the year. And then it will interpret those written oracles, which seem so altogether concealed and blind to us. Man can quite break the seal and interpret that written oracle. But when the word unfolds in us, then the whole thing seems so simple. And we wonder why we hadn't seen it before. Now, the Bible is simply the biography of God. So you read it. And then you don't understand it before the word erupts. But you read it. And you have a very good memory. You know exactly what you read. And one day, suddenly, unexpectedly, the time has come and the word which went forth from the mouth of God the Father and abides in you as your own wonderful human imagination begins to unfold. And it unfolds and the biography you thought belonged to another is all about you. Because everything said in that story concerning a seeming other, you are now beginning to experience. And you experience it in detail. You must gain the certainty that you are God. For if this is the biography of God, and it becomes your biography, because you can't deny the experiences. You could no more deny the experiences that you have had, though they are mystical, than you could deny the experience of being here now. I know I am here. I know you are here. I know where I am at the moment, for this is a simple, simple occurrence. I could no more deny this as something that I've actually experienced at this moment in time than I can now deny these experiences that are part of the story of God. Now we are told this is what you're going to hear on Christmas morning, what you will hear from now on, on Sunday morning, that I bring you good news. Not any sad thing. I bring you good news. When all these who are bringing the good news are all dressed up like undertakers. Here, the story is the story of good news. I bring you good news. What is the good news? That this day is born in the city of David a Savior. This day is born in the city of David a Savior. 
That's the good news. Then the sign that it has happened is this. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Well, the Bible quoted in Scripture is the Old Testament. There is no portion of the New when it uses the word Scripture. As Scripture said, and Scripture cannot be broken. It is only referring to the Old Testament. And the Old Testament only acknowledges one Savior. Read it in the 43rd and 45th chapters of Isaiah. I am the Lord, your God, your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior. The Lord is the only Savior. He says, I, even I, am He. I am the Lord, your God, your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior. Therefore, if a Savior is born, it should be the definite article, the Savior is born. For there are not many Saviors, only one Savior. The Lord, our God, that Lord is one. And if He is the Savior, and He is born this day in the city of David. And David is born, David took the stronghold of Zion and renamed it the city of David. But he went up into Zion through the water shaft. He went up in a way that no one could ever suspect, as we are told in the book of Samuel. He built from the outside in and up at the same time. The only way you could do that is by building a spiral. So he built a spiral, and that's a true motion that you make from generation into regeneration. You go up like a serpent, right up into Zion. This is Zion. Zion is not on the north shoulder of Africa. Zion is right here in your own wonderful skull. That's the city of David. That is the stronghold that he took. And in that area, a child is born. A child only symbolizing the birth of the Savior. And the Savior is the Lord God Jehovah. Now I read the story of the Lord God Jehovah. And then suddenly, in me, that story begins to unfold. I cannot come to any other conclusion than that the fact I am He. So then I need not be told thereafter that unless I believe I am He, I will continue in my sin, for I know I am He. So if this is true of Him, and only of Him, and then it became true of me, well then I must be the very one spoken of in Scripture as the Lord God Jehovah. Even though I am now a simple little man, that every day it gets older and older, the body gets weaker and weaker, and eventually it will burn up, they will take it from me, or I will simply depart from it, and they'll discard it. But in spite of that, that in me, that has the experience, that being in me, call by any name, call it by any name, it is the Lord God Jehovah. That is a story true of every being in the world, and everyone is going to experience it. Not some little being born of a woman who did not know a man. That has nothing to do with the story. Now they begin to question that in the Catholic Church. I saw here recently that this American priest begins to question seriously the story of the virgin birth. It's something entirely different. You were born of mortal parents. You're destined to be reborn of immortal parents. And when you are reborn, you yourself are the parent. For you are the one that is born, that is called God. For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. For well, that's the sign. That's no little child that was born. The child is solid and solidly real when you hold that child in your hands. But it's only a sign that you were born. You who became flesh and blood. For the word that went forth from the mouth of God became flesh 
and dwelt within us. That's what we are told in the book of John. And he abides within us forever. But now he comes to interpret the written oracle. And as he unfolds within us, I am the living word that makes real the written word. For it was a closed book until it unfolded within me. And everything said in this story that will be repeated from pulpit to pulpit in the next month, I personally have experienced. And I am not unlike any child born a woman. I was born in the same way you were born, that my father loved my mother, and in that heat of passion, I was conceived. They didn't plan me, I just came. Came into the world as you came into the world. Those who go planning a child, the chances are they get a moron. These things happen because we are in love with the being that, who bears our name, as it were. And there are moments when all of a sudden you're carried away with a fire that is all in generation. And so the child, you love the child, you raise the child, it's like every other child in the world. And that child, like every child in the world, contains the word of God. And the word of God and God are one. The same being. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So his name shall be called the word of God. And that word abides forever in us. The word became flesh and dwelt within us. It's translated among us. But it's not. The word is within us. He dwells within us. And who is this one dwelling within me? My own wonderful human imagination. That is the word of God. And that is God. And one day, to prove that it is, the events recorded in Scripture, in these wonderful oracles of Scripture, unfold within me, casting me in the first person, in the central role of the story. The individual must actually experience Scripture for himself to understand how altogether wonderful it is. It is his biography because it's God's biography. And when the word of God, which is God, unfolds in the individual, that is his story. And so it's all written about him as told us in Scripture, in the 40th Psalm. In the volume of the book, it is all about me. Now he could not restrain himself from telling it to all the congregation. He said, if I now hold it back, there is within me, like a burning fire, all shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. You can no longer restrain the impulse to tell it. Ninety-nine percent will simply turn their back upon you. As you're told in Scripture, his own rejected him, because they knew him. They knew his brothers, his sisters, his father, his mother, all mortal beings round about him. And he dares to claim this extravagant claim for himself. That's blasphemy. He's taken the name of God in vain. Because man dares to claim that he is what formerly he worshipped as something on the outside. And it's not on the outside at all. It's all within us. And so it only tells the story of the things that happen in the individual soul. And these things were not seen and they were not heard by any one other than the one in whom they occurred. And because of the occurrence of these experiences, he gained the certainty, well, I am he. Because these things happen only to God. Well, if they happen only to God, well then, they happen to me, then I must be he. Now, you can't restrain it. Go and tell the world, at least your world. Tell it to anyone who will listen. And have them tell it to others. And although they have not yet had the experience, if they accept it and believe it, they're qualified to tell it. Let them go and out spread the word. But who is this word? He said, this, this wonderful word, he tells the story of a parable. That a sower went forth to sow. And as he sowed, he sowed what? Seed. But he tells us, as he interprets the parable, the seed was the word of God. He's telling this gospel story because the evangelists were not reciting or recording something that happened to another, as you're led to believe. They related their own experience. 
That's what they're telling. But they told it that man would accept it. So they told it in the third person and spoke of him. When really they should have spoken or could have spoken of themselves. For they were only relating their own experience. So in the very end, in the book of Luke, and when the whole thing was coming to its end, they told what had happened. But a better translation of that Greek phrase is they related their own experience. But if you tell that, well then people will simply cast it aside. That was all hallucination. As a friend of mine said to me, all oh, recently, when I was explaining to his brother this wonderful thing that happened within me. And he said, oh, that was all hallucination. I said, well, first of all, you are a mechanic. You deal with automobiles all day long. Would you let me tamper with your engine? No, I cannot drive a car. I have never owned a car. I've owned a car, but I didn't drive it. I gave it to my daughter. When she was a minor and could not own it, I kept it, and I paid all expenses of it, but I gave it to her. So that's the only car that I have ever owned. And one day I got some little uh, infraction that she had because I was the owner, I got the uh, salmon. So that was my experience with owning a car. Now will you let me now tamper with your car if it needs some help? He said, I will not. I said, then you dare to tell me that you want to tamper with the book of God and you know nothing about it? When it is already unfolded within me and you're going to tell me about the word of God? And tell me it's hallucination when you wouldn't let me put one little screw into your engine because you know it and I don't. But you're going to tell me, one who has been sent to actually explain the word of God through personal experience that it's hallucination. Didn't persuade him at all. He still wants to be the author of his own car and I can't touch it, but he also wants to be the author of the book of God. And he hasn't ever experienced one word of it. When I said to him, do you consider yourself a Christian? He said, no, I am nothing. But you're going to tell me all about the Christian mystery. Well, no, he is not alone, may I tell you. You can multiply him by unnumbered people in the world. They always have opinions on things that they know nothing about. But that's true of all of us, really. However, the story that is being told and will be told and repeated over and over until Christmas comes and they close the book for another year is the eternal story and it's all about man and it's all in the Old Testament. So I now go back to the Old Testament first, only in the Old. I have come to fulfill scripture, he said. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. And beginning with Moses in the law and the prophets and the Psalms, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So I go and I read scripture. Is God in the Old Testament a father? Yes, it's stated quite clearly that he's a father. The psalmist proclaims him as father. And then the father acknowledges the son. And who was that son? He said to someone, he said, thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. Well, who was the one mentioned in the Old Testament? It is David. And David said, I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. In the 89th Psalm, that was now the second Psalm, in the 89th Psalm, the Lord now speaks, I have found David. And he shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God and the rock of my salvation. So here I find that he is a father, and he has a son, and the son's name is David. But I never thought for one moment, living in the 20th century, a man who was not yet, well, in 1959, I was not 60. I was born in 60, 1905. So here I am, 54 years old, in the 20th century, it never occurred to me that I had any relationship to David. I read it as history. I was taught it as history. And suddenly, the whole thing is unfolding within me, like a tree bearing fruit. And here is David. And I know instantly that I am his father. 
and he knows instantly that he is my son. Well, here is the story unfolding within me. And here we are separated in time by at least 3,000 years, if you take it as a chronological story based upon secular history. The difference of 3,000 years separating the two of us, and yet I am his father. Therefore, I am older than he, I am his father. And I know it more intimately than I know that I am the father of my two earthly children, my son and my daughter. It's the most intimate relationship and one of infinite joy. He is so beautiful when you look at him. You can't describe the beauty of David. Now, does it say anything about the child? Yes. In Isaiah, the seventh chapter of Isaiah and the ninth chapter of Isaiah. And unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of his reign there shall be no end. Here is a child that is born. In the seventh chapter of Isaiah, we speak of a woman that shall bring forth a child. And the child's name is Emmanuel, which is God with us. That's what the word means. So the child bears witness to the fact that God is with us. Well then, is he now the father of the child? It's the sign that God is born. His word has borne fruit. For his word cannot come back to him void. It must accomplish that which he purposed and prosper in the thing for which he sent it. Now the word is returning to the father, as the father. For all this is the story of God the father. Now the father is returning to himself. His diversified being is being gathered together, one by one, into that original whole but augmented by reason of the experience of the adventure. God himself is within the adventure. God became as we are by reason of the word of God, which is God abiding in us. So he became as we are. For what purpose? That we may be as he is. So at Calvary, God, became man. That was the incarnation. At Bethlehem, man becomes God. That's the birth of God. Not from any womb of a woman, but out of the great temple from above called the city of David, called Bethlehem. This is the Zion of Scripture. As we are told in the 87th Psalm, and it comes now to the story, and he said, this one was born here, and that one was born there, all in Zion, for Zion is God's chosen place for a dwelling place. And now he numbers all of them, and this was born here, that was born there, all born within Zion, like the cells of the brain, each becoming awake as God. Take one brain, infinite brain, and say all the brain cells becoming one after the other, all being born. And they're all God. There's nothing but God. So that's the story of Christmas. But as long as man teaches it as he's taught it, well then, he's not going to see it. On the other hand, it's the best way to tell it, because we are still children. And truth embodied in a tale shall enter in at lowly doors. So you tell it in the form of a tale that man may really grasp it. If you told it as it really is, it's too abstract. And he can't really fathom it. He can't follow it. So you tell it that the child mind could grasp it. And it grasped it for a while. Then comes the great shock when it isn't so at all. It's something far greater. But the destruction of that altar that he set up only makes room for a still greater altar. And a still greater altar. As you destroy it, it becomes something far greater and greater. For truth is an ever-expanding illumination. So, God became, as we are, with all the weaknesses, all the infirmities, all the limitations that 
you and I express in this world. And he took upon himself all the tears. Now, he moved forward towards the goal. And the goal is that God in us, called the word in us, should unfold within us. As God, but as something less than God. So this is Christmas. This is the story that is the eternal story, told first in the Old Testament. But you're told in the book of Daniel, seal the book until that day when he comes who is worthy to break the seal. Well, the only one worthy to break the seal is when it happens. So it happens in man. And that same presence that is God is in every man. So in man, the seal broke. And that man told his own experiences, that which took place in his own soul. And if you read scripture carefully, take the oldest of the Gospels, Mark, when you read that first chapter, you cannot come to any conclusion other than the fact that no one but he on whom the dove descended saw it. Yet it's told as though others saw it, only the one on whom it descended saw it. Read the first chapter when you go home. And you cannot come to any conclusion that he had a witness to that event. The heavens opened and it descended on him. He tells the story. If you take the story of the temptation, how could I actually, if he is alone in the desert, how would I know what the so-called devil said to him and his answer all from the Old Testament? Every answer he made to the doubter was taken from Deuteronomy. One after the other, all these are answers to doubt. Well, if I'm going to record what he said, he would have to have told me what he said. Because he's alone, you're told, for 40 days and 40 nights he is in the desert, alone. And now someone is recording what he said to the devil when the devil appeared, quoting only the book of Deuteronomy. Well, if I'm going to be the evangelist to record that, either he told me or I'm making it up. So the one who's had the experience tells it. And so the whole book is based upon the personal experience of the individual. All theology and all ecclesiasticism are secondary growths superimposed upon the mystical experience of the individual. Everyone, I don't care what theology it is, they're superimposed. And then they'll fight wars to protect that superimposition. But the personal one, the one who has had the experience, and he doesn't have to go beyond scripture for confirmation. Now he comes as a witness. For we are told if two different ones agree in testimony, it is conclusive. While you have the written word of God, these written oracles, and then you have your own experience of the written word. You are the living word who now takes the written word and you make it alive. Now there are two entirely different Beings, as it were, here is a written word, seemingly predating you by unnumbered centuries, and you, the living word, and all that is said here, you predated it. For here David is mentioned in the written word, and the living word now unfolds within you, and you predate him because you are his father. So who are you but the one dictating through your servants, the prophets, what you're going to come into the world and do? And you're going to actually prove to yourself you are a father. And the only way you could ever prove that you are a father, if the son you named in your written oracle calls you father. And then David calls you father. And here he is, the symbol of humanity. The whole vast world with all the experiences of man. Pressed into one grand whole. And that concentrated time into which all the generations of men and their experiences are now compressed and fused. Personified comes out as David. So you've gone through the gamut and you've played the entire part. All that man could ever be, you've done it because God plays all the parts. God only acts and is in existing beings or men. He is the actor in man. Your own wonderful human imagination, that is God, and he is the actor. Now you could act this night any part you want, and it will come to pass. 
But the great act is coming out, bringing forth in a living way his oracle. they seem to be dead when written on paper, and man can seem to understand them. But this intimate relationship between the living word and that written oracle, all of a sudden, shows itself in the one in whom the living word unfolds. So the word became flesh, and dwelt not among us, dwelt within us. And in this garment of flesh and blood, it abides, and it abides forever and forever. And one day, it's going to erupt. And after it erupts, you are compelled to tell it. Then, will come that moment in time, you'll take off the garment. For no one can attain to bliss unless he is generated on earth. So here, you are on earth, that is a glorious blessing. Because only the seed planted in earth can actually unfold and interpret the oracle. And this is the earth, this is the Adam. So every child generated on earth becomes now the seed, that is the seal, or the, I would say the soil, on which and in which the seed of God, which is himself, is planted. And that seed is called the word of God. Now death will not stop earth, because things do not terminate at that point where my senses cease to register them. 
If you drop now, it doesn't matter. You're in a world just as solidly real as this. And you will continue, and the word abides in you, and you're just as solidly real as you are now. And in due time, it's going to unfold within you. And all that I have told you, you know is going to be true. And you and I will meet in eternity. The brothers have returned, but now we are God the Father. Without loss of identity. We haven't lost our identity. We are one with God the Father. That is the Father's purpose. To give us himself. So it's the Father who actually became us. That story is told us in the parable of the son who came in to the vineyard. And they killed him thinking by killing him we will now get the vineyard. And then came the father and came the Lord himself. What would he do to those servants that killed his son, his only son? Well, that is the wonderful story of Stowe. That son is David. And David, you're told in scripture, and he died. And his tomb is with us unto this day. And the father comes to resurrect his son. But the father resurrects first. He has to. And as he resurrects himself, then he raises up his son. And his son comes 139 days after the father resurrects. He awakens within the tomb, which is really the holy womb. And that is the skull of man. And he comes out and all the imagery of scripture surrounds him. And then 139 days later, an explosion takes place within him. The immortal head. And here comes David. So he does. He keeps his promise. He is a faithful God. And he resurrects his son. And the son reveals him as the father. He had to find the son or he would never know he was the father. For he had promised David not to leave him in the pit. Not to leave him in hell. So he raises up David. And that is our story. The truest story ever told and the greatest story ever told. Let no one, because he has had it, crow and brag, because everyone's going to have it. And no one will be better than, and the last will be equal to the first. So let no one think for one moment, because you preceded this one in the actual unfolding of the word within you, that you are better than. Not better than. There is no such thing as better than. I could not honestly feel any feeling about wanting to be better than my father, earthly father, and my earthly mother. I would heartily dislike that feeling. And I know they departed this world and they did not experience this. I know they are aware of what has happened within their son, their earthly son called Neville. But I look forward to the day when they'll have the identical experience and we are one. But certainly not because I preceded them in the experience to be better than. It's one emotion I could not stomach. They were too loving, too altogether wonderful in my world to want at any moment to be better than my parents. But we are moving towards the grandparent, who is God. And when we move towards him, we are God. So you read the story and you find out he did have a son. And the son is David. Now in the New Testament, they say Jesus. But Jesus means Jehovah. It's the same thing as Joshua. And both mean Jehovah is salvation. And we only have one Savior, which is the Lord, our God your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior. Therefore, they call him Jesus. But it means Jehovah. It's Jehovah that is born in man because the word that abides in man unfolds and bears the fruit that it contains. And the fruit is the fatherhood and the son, the ascent like a fiery serpent, the descent of the dove, which seals the agreement that this is it. But that comes last. Now, in the New Testament, it's the first event recorded in the book of Mark. 
But you're told the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So that event that is the first recorded is the last that you experience. The first that you do experience is the resurrection. That seemingly would be on a secular base, would be the last. For resurrection will be followed by, I mean, that is, uh, not resurrection, but I mean crucifixion would be the very last event of a man. No, that is the very first. Crucifixion is over. We are all crucified. That's Calvary on these garments. But now at Bethlehem, which seems to be the first, that is the last. That's when man becomes God. So at Calvary, God becomes Man, that's the incarnation. At Bethlehem, man becomes God. And the whole thing unfolds in that manner. The first that is last, but the last is first. Now I know it's not the easiest thing to grasp, especially after being told over the years what we have been told. It has only confused the matter. One should never for one moment think that the old can be separated from the new, these two testaments. You would have no new without the old. And the old would be incomplete without the new. For as Disraeli said, the new is the fulfillment of the old. Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism, said Benjamin Disraeli. And he never hid his background, his very name, if you know the name, this really is of Israel, but Benjamin is the last son of Jacob. Benjamin of Israel is the name Benjamin Disraeli. And so he was very proud of the fact that he was a Jew and told the whole House of Commons. And they all knew him and accepted him just as he was. And he became the Prime Minister, the highest office in England. And he actually was Prime Minister when England was a power in this world. He was the one that got the canal. He was the one that brought India into the crown of Victoria. And that was Benjamin Disraeli. But he never once denied he was a Jew of Jews. But he saw that the New Testament, or rather Christianity, if understood, was only the fulfillment of Judaism. And it was he too seeing what the story told. He said man is not the creature of circumstances. Circumstances are the creatures of men. And he proved it in his own life. We are not the creatures of circumstances. Circumstances are the creatures of men. We create them. How? By our own wonderful human imagination. So he was a great biblical student, but he could see. Maybe he had the experiences.
And maybe it was not wise to tell it in the form that I tell it. Because he saw it clearly. I doubt you can see it clearly without the experience. The experience gives meaning to the things that your intellect may suspect, but you can't quite put your finger on it through the intellect. You've got to experience it. And when you experience it, well then the whole thing unfolds and you see it so clearly. So you and I are now bearing God. God walks the earth as you walk the earth. And whatever you do, whether it be nice or unlovely, it is still God. And he waits on you quite indifferently and quite swiftly when that something in you called the will is evil as when it is good. So let others say if they will, but the so-called others eventually will come to the conclusion that I have told you tonight. When they say that, as you're told in the Psalms, the 14th, and I think it's the 54th Psalm, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. So anyone who will tell you, and brave as he is, that there is no God, well, he may be very wise in the eyes of man, but scripture defines him as a fool. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So Blake, in taking that theme from the 54th Psalm and the 14th Psalm, he said he calls the fool Babel, for Babel symbolizes the confusion of tongues and the misunderstanding of minds because you can't quite understand the tongue of the other. And so complete misunderstanding. So he said, Babel mocks, saying there is no God, nor Son of God. That thou, O human imagination, O divine body, art all a delusion. But I know thee, O Lord. See, he equates now God, the Son, and the Lord as one being. God the Son, and the Lord, and he puts them together with the human imagination. They say it is all delusion, but I know thee, O human imagination, O divine body. Then he said, when you arise upon my weary eyes, every morning I see him arise upon my weary eyes when he builds that bridge of incident to bring me back from the deep being to the surface being. And in the twinkle of an eye, he creates a bridge of incident across which I go to find myself on the surface mind, awake in this world. And then the voice answers him when he tells the voice. He said, but thou, you suffer with me, but I behold thee not. You cannot see imagination as you see objects, but you see only the imaginal activity in objects. But imagination itself is not seen. You see objects in the world that it creates. But we are the reality that is named imagination. That is God. And then the voice answers. And the voice says, fear not. I am with you always. Only believe in me. That I have power to raise from death thy brother who sleeps in Albion. Albion being a symbol of the vast man that is asleep, humanity. <laughs> Believe in me, who? He tells you who he is, the human imagination. And all of a sudden, one day, you're going to awake, and as you awake, you are the Lord God. And the whole drama, because he is a father, his son is present. And his son is humanity, personified as a single youth. And you are the father. Individualized completely, and the Father of God's Son, therefore God. So when these things happen in you, and it's all the biography of God, then you must gain the certainty that you are God. Now this is the story of Christmas, but it will not be told in this light on Christmas morning. They will have all kinds of little things that just didn't exist, but it's for the child mind. And the child need not be a little infant. The child could be a man 90 years old. 
And do you know that the people who are the most bigoted are the ones who really do not know scripture, but they'll read it all day? I have an aunt like that. She's now in her 90s. And she, one day she said to me that I'm going to the devil because I believe what I believe. And I said to her quite casually, why well, I should not have said it anyway, but I did. I said, you, you know that Jesus had brothers? Oh, she thought I was the most devilish being in the world. I really hope you enjoyed this video. And thank you so very much to all my Patreon members. For $5 a month, my members receive exclusive affirmations, instructional videos, and so much more. Link to sign up in the description.